Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us returning guest, Katrina Reyes. Katrina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, Katrina, we were in our last interview, you, you were talking, uh, your story, basically, your mother joins the Sea Org and you're 11 years old and join with her. That's and, correct. And you come from Russia to Clearwater, Florida. Now, one, yes. one thing I want to go back to pick up on, before the show, you were telling me that you and your mother were separated during the uh, States Project Force or the Scientology Sea Boot Camp training. That's right. Um, what happened? Well, like I said earlier, my mother finished the uh, Estates, um, the EPF. She finished it pretty fast. She did it in about three months, and I was on it for about a year. So while we were on EPF, we were living together. And then once she finished, you know, she became a, a staff member. So they moved her out. And not only did they move her out of the same apartment, they actually completely moved her to another birthing facility, which was half an hour away from me by bus, which was uh, the old quality inn hotel, uh, motel right. in Clearwater. And I stayed at the Hacienda. And as eleven as an eleven year old, it's pretty devastating to not be with your mother. I mean, there wasn't that much time to spend with each other, but at least we saw each other in the evening. And um, I brought it, you know, I I got very upset about it, and I spoke my mind, and I was just told, well, you have to finish the EPF as fast as possible, so that way you can go and live with her. Um. Which I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> as long as I finish the EPF and I can go live with her, that's fine. Um, little did I know, my mother started dating this Russian guy who is my stepfather right now. And they got married secretly um, because my mother knew I would have gotten upset because I wanted to live with her. Now, for people who don't know about the Sea Org or the way the rules are, a married couple are not allowed to live with their children. So they lived by themselves, and I lived by myself separately. And that upset me even more because now I couldn't even live with my mother even after I finished the EPF. And I was very upset about the fact that she was getting married again, which was her fifth marriage. And my mother actually wrote a knowledge report on me, which in Scientology, you pretty much have to go and tattletale on everybody, and that's the policy, and she told me that I'm creating so much problems for her with this whole marriage and living situation that it's taken her mind off her job, and she's not able to do her job properly because her mind is occupied with this, like I have created a problem for her, and I actually got in trouble for it, believe it or not. No, I, I, that's just devastating. But look, look at a couple. Look at a couple things. One, I, I just have to say it as a parent: your your mom's a lousy mother. Just yes, lousy. for sure. I mean, any, anyone, any outsider looking in can say abandoning your daughter when she's eleven years old, marrying when you know that that forbids you from seeing your child. So I mean, this is this is a story over and over in Sea Org. Sea parents abandon their children. Yes. And that's the brutal reality. Church of Scientology says it's pro-family. It's anything but pro-family. Scientology breaks up families by design. Well, I just want to make like a cliche point. In order for you to be a perfect, good Sea member, and if you are a perfect, good Sea member, you are automatically become a horrible parent. And that's just the way it works because you know, if you're going to be dedicated, dedicating your life in 24-7 to the steward, you have to completely abandon your kids. Yeah, there's no room for children uh, no. in the Sea Org. There's just not. Uh, um, Ron Hubbard wrote a policy about Sea Org members making children has caused problems. And even, yeah. the, even the derisive term used, making children, well, that's what people do. Uh, by evolution, 
or if you're theistic, by God's design, you, you reproduce. Exactly. Right? People have children in general. But but in the Seerk world, you don't mean anything. I mean, this you must have felt really dehumanized as a child to not be important and even get in trouble for interfering. I felt um, when I thought that when we were joining the Seerk, I thought it was like a clean slate for me and my mother because we obviously had a very strenuous relationship with him before that. And for me, I kind of, I kind of got a little bit excited because I was thinking, even under these circumstances that we are now in the Sea Org and everything else, but uh, we have a clean slate, and my mother isn't gonna go crazy, wild, partying, missing for a few days. You know, I felt like she's gonna pay more attention to me because now it's just her job and me. And I was very devastated because it. As, as a somebody who, um, as a child, and this is not only in Scientology, but with other children whose parents have abandoned them, you just, you always have this, uh, how can I describe this? It, it, it's, it, you just, you just want your, your parents' love, sure. unconditional love. Yeah, every child and, does. You want to be, you want your mom, mom and dad to love you. You know, even just the non-Scientologists, but the, you know, you have parents who are alcoholics and who are druggies and their kids love them to death. And only thing they want is just for their par parents to love them back. And I felt so betrayed and I felt so lost. And I was like, the, I on the only thing I want is just for you to love me and just be with me and care. So, yeah, for me, it was very devastating. Now, in this case, Katrina, the knowledge report in Scientology your mother wrote on you, that actually serves as a weapon she can use against you. Exactly. I mean, you, your your mom writes a KR on you. Now, t please tell our listeners who, who are not that familiar with Scientology, what happens when you get a knowledge report written on you? When you get a knowledge report written on you, if it's nothing serious and it's just like a little thing, you don't get in trouble or anything. But if it's something serious, like in the fact that my mother stated in the knowledge report that I have created a problem and, you know, all this stuff, um, then you get pulled into the ethics officers um, and they basically now have to handle you. So at that point, I was actually assigned to do a security check at 11 years old, and I had tele te tailor-made questions um, just for me, and a lot of those questions were, what have you done towards your mother, what kind of overt and withholds, and since this was my fifth stepdad, um, I told him that, you know, I have a lot of problems with stepdads and this and being abused, um, and it just went on. The interrogation just went on, on to, well, what have you done to your previous stepdads? Um, because you pulled it in. If you have been physically beaten, um, then you must have done something to him so that he will beat you. Which was so, again, just so dehumanizing. And then as an 11-year-old, I was just... I. I I couldn't believe it. I was just like, it, it, it was such a shock. And, it, and Certainly it is. And look, an 11-year-old doesn't have the emotional capacity to deal with these kinds of things. Exactly. And and you look, it's hard enough out here in the regular world, the, the WOG world, as Scientology calls it, when, when a, a, something like this happens outside, it's hard enough already, but you add in the fact that Scientology is a cult. And one of the defining characteristics of Scientology that's hard for outsiders to understand is you get blamed for everything that happens to you. You caused it. You pulled it in. Exactly. So there's no understanding, no attempt at, at say, I understand the pain you're feeling. It's yeah. Complete the opposite. What have you done? to to ruin you know what have you done to do this and and why are you interfering with your mother's ability to produce to to work for the sea orc 
That's correct. Yeah, so there's this... and there and there's no compassion whatsoever, and and you go from being a victim of um, mental and physical abuse by a stepfather to this horrible bad person that did something to pull this in. So do you just have to stuff it all down? I mean, how do you get out of it? Do you do you have to acknowledge that? Yeah, I must have done something bad. Does it change the way you think? Yeah, I have. Throughout the years of being in the Sea Rock and being in Scientology, I just have learned to shove down my opinions and my pain and everything else and just bury it as far as I can possibly can. Um, even when I, even when I felt like somebody did do wrong by me in the Sea Rock, I wouldn't even bring it up because I knew I was going to get blamed. So you just learn. It's a coping mechanism. You just learn to bury it deep down and move on, put a smile on your face, and keep going. So then your mother, I mean, for all practical intents and purposes, you your, your childhood ends, you know, you, you never had a normal childhood. Never. And, never. It's, and it's only made worse by the Church of Scientology. That's correct. So so moving forward after this after this horrible event, after your, your mother betraying you by writing a KR, and it is betrayal. You, you, why would you report a loved one uh, you know for some some for having feelings? Uh, you, Mom, I want your love, you know, so that gets written up, right? That becomes a, a crime. You finish the the EPF and and then you go on post. Mm -hmm. Like you're you're supposed to be just a working adult. Yes. Uh, which to some people, um, me speaking to some other um, the second generation uh, Scientology kids that were either born or brought up into Scientologist children, um, for some of them it felt good that they were treated as um, as a grown up because as a child you hate being told what to do and things like that. Um, for me, it was a little bit different because I never really had a good childhood and I never really experienced a childhood. I was kind of on my own since I was five. I had to take care of myself pretty much. Um, so I wanted to experience the childhood. I really wanted to go to school. I wanted to go and play with the other kids. I wanted to, I just wanted to, to be a normal kid. And um, the fact that we weren't allowed to go to school um, was a really big toll on me because I've really enjoyed going to school and I've really wanted to get at least a GED. Sure. Yeah, high school diploma. Yeah. Uh, for listeners outside the United States, a, a GED is the equivalent of a high school diploma. And, and not, they have this. Um, system in the United States. Well, I'll, I'll edit that part out, Katrina. Okay. Yeah. No problem. But I can understand you wanting to, to, to at least have a high school education, and, and the church is denying you even that right. Exactly. I mean, we were allowed to go to a quote unquote school, which was kind of like homeschooling, um, every single Saturday uh, from 1 p.m. till 10 p.m. We were sent to Quality Inn, uh, the old hotel, and it would just be all the kids in one room, all different ages, and we would just pretty much study the regular school materials, math, history, and all this stuff. And um, you kind of went on your own pace. So if you're a fast learner, you can, you know, finish and get your GED pretty fast. If you're a slow learner, with me, I had another a kind of situation is that I, I first had to learn English. So it took me a couple of years to learn English to the point where I can read Shakespeare <laughs> and understand and read history books. Um, and then when I turned 18, I was told I cannot go to school anymore. And I was so close to finishing and passing the exam to get my diploma. I was so upset. I asked, I actually, um, I wrote a petition asking if I could continue attending school once a week on Saturday um, just for a few more months so I could just finish the last two subjects, which was 
algebra and literature. And that was denied. And I was told, by law, you're 18 and you don't have to attend the school anymore. And that's an important point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, to its discredit and shame, the Church of Scientology makes this statement. We in the Church of Scientology adhere to all applicable child labor laws. And, and I've always found that to be very appalling. There should be no child labor, period. Exactly. That, that, that's something that you hear about in third world countries, the exploitation of children. But to deny a, a, someone an education, something that will benefit them for life because they're 18 and now they have to produce for the Sea Org, it's just criminal. Yeah. So, but, but that's the state of mind. Is, is a Sea Org member is a coin. They use that term coin to yes. speak of Sea Org members. Now, what does it mean to be a coin? Well, that's pretty much just you were just. I, I never really heard them. Maybe it's something that was used in LA, but a flag. It was um, another producing body. That was a very, um, very not you know, but common thing that they would say. We need more producing bodies. Really? That, yes. Oh, that's that's uh, that offers us some insight into the church. So you're just another producing body. Yes. Exactly. That's horrible. That's a horrible way to think of people. Yeah. Like in the content, uh, to put it in the content, I would hear that there was an event and they need to set up the chairs, the tables, you know, all that stuff. And the um, one of the executives will come over and say, we need more producing bodies over here to get this done. <laughs> and and it, you know what? It's such a cultic language as well, producing yes. bodies. Nobody talks like Nobody talks like that out here. When I did yes. in corporate life for 30 years, you know, we did trade shows, right? Mm -hmm. And so you might use a term like, we need more help. We need more yes. people, mm -hmm. you know. And normally what we would do, like at a trade show, is, you know, we would hire, there, there were workers you could hire and we would pay them mm -hmm. to help set up the trade show. But you would never hear that out here in the regular world. We need more producing bodies. In fact, people would stop and say, what the hell are you talking about? Exactly. What more planet are you from? <laughs> more, more producing bodies. Okay, so, you, uh, so you're a producing body then. Out here, I've heard the term coin, and that just means uh, coins can be exchanged. Yeah, that's so if, true. So if I'm running one Sea Org unit and you're running another, we, we'll exchange coins. Mm -hmm. So I need like more muscle power over here, more people to move mast, and you yes. need more people who could do paperwork. So we might just swap out some producing bodies, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really, a, really quite a, dement, a demented way to think about people, just as units of production. Yeah, um, it, and, and that reminds me of um, my husband. He's not, an, he's not a Scientologist, and the first time um, – my mother came to visit and they were talking and we we're having a conversation. My mother said something along the lines like, oh, and this person dropped the body. And you should have seen my husband's look on his face. And he was like, what did she just say? Like, wait, wait, what, do you, what does she mean, drop your body? That just, it's so crazy. And I was like, wait, wait, it, it's a Scientology term. <laughs> just don't pay attention. <laughs> yeah, for, for listeners, dropping the body means to die. Yep. And Scientology believes you if, you if you are full OT and you have all the powers, you can literally drop your body whenever you feel like it. You just drop the body. Now, again, this goes back to the, the, the orientation. Um, L. Ron Hubbard called the human body a meat body. Mm -hmm. The meat body. Yep. And, it's, and, and sometimes when uh, Scientologists want to invalidate others, they'll call them meat bodies. Mm-hmm. And Hubbard spoke of the genetic entity, you know, as if we're just these stupid meat bodies with like, a, like no, you know, no ability to think. We were hypnotized zombies. Exactly. Yeah. So, so when you, we had a Sea Org member here, by the way, in Los Angeles, and uh, she was working and she died on post. She died at her desk. That must or, have been a big problem for them. Well, you know what? The story, um, and I don't want to use her name out of respect for her, mm -hmm. her, her son, okay? But you, you can find it online. Um, she was working, long-term SEERG member. She died at her desk. 
And they were shouting at her, come back into the body commands. Oh, my God. You know, n- never mind calling 911, right? Oh. Because, because to have an ambulance come up to pack base would be out PR. Or just try to do CPR. <laughs> yeah, and I and they may have. I wasn't there, but I know uh, th- that they were shouting at her. That they, Scientologists believe if you have OT powers, you can command a person to come back into the body. Oh, that's just fascinating to me because I've seen so many OTs that are dying from cancer and everything else. <laughs> yeah, and and well, they you know they're. they're memorial Scientology's memorial to this poor woman who died at her desk working was that she maintained production all the way until the end oh and that was God, wow that was, that was the highest tribute is they worked her to death wow and never mind getting her a doctor or medical care or whatever predisposed her because she was young when she died mm-hmm. um never mind you know getting her medical care yeah uh, it's like she kept producing until she dropped the body. So let's give her a round of applause. Um, it's appalling. It's just so inhumane. It's so inhumane. It's so so going back, you're, you have your fifth stepdad. Are, do you see your mother after that? Very rarely. Once in, once in a while, maybe once or twice a week, I would see her over dinner, which was half an hour. And that's it. I think the longest stretch I went not seeing her was about uh, two to three months. Did relations between you two grow grow cold after she got married, or did she? Were you still on good terms with her? No, it got even worse. Um, we were just kind of acquaintances, to put it in the light terms. Well, now Scientology uh, doesn't really believe that family exists per se, do they? Do they? Aren't you guys just unrelated Thetans who share a common genetic line? Well, the way it was told to me um, when they were trying to handle my upset with my mother was, um, you're a student member now, and your number one priority is to produce so that we could clear the planet. So you are just acting out, and you're being spoiled little brat. And seeing your mother isn't the most important thing. She's very important to the Sea Org and she has a job to do. And you need to stop throwing your little hissy fits because she needs to do her job to clear this planet. That's brutal. So you're actually getting in the way of clearing the planet. Yes. You and you and your little needy emotional problems. Exactly. So just get over it, Katrina. Yes. And you have a job to do as well clearing the planet. Of course. Look at the stuff they run on you. Yeah. It's insane. I look back at it now, and and I always wonder, how did I mentally survive all that and haven't, like, been locked up in a a mental institution in a straitjacket? Well, because you're resilient. You're one of those people who are very resilient, and some people who, who have horrible childhoods, are very resilient and they come out of it and, and you're one of those fortunate people who are very resilient um, now we talked yesterday you got assigned after you finally got out of a state's project force to is a technical page yes and um, so then we we're talking about uh, you know comparing religious traditions I after the our last show we were talking and I mentioned me growing up as a Christian mm-hmm. one thing that was so criminal was masturbation Yes. And, uh, and it's no different in Scientology, except it's probably worse than in Christianity. It's, get- it's something, um, I don't know, I, I can't, um, I'm going to try to find the best ways to describe it, because it's almost like they are so, this, especially in the Sea Org, it is so emphasized. And anytime you ever get in trouble and you get put on the e-meter for, you know, to, to, to get things off your chest, what are your crimes, what have you done? It's always emphasized. The first thing, all the questions are very sexual questions, which I'm like, why is it, why is it always sexual question? Why is it such a big deal? And people will get punished so badly for 
any little thing that's just so normal in the real world. So what would they ask you? I mean, how does the sex check begin? Is that there? Are they looking to set you up for a fall? Well, they would. No, it's more like, you know, um, have you made out with your boyfriend? Yes. Well, I see a read there. What else did you do? And I'm like, nothing. That's it. And then they would, you know, the questions are, you know, have you, you know, have you masturbated? Has he touched you somewhere? This and that. And um, it just goes on deeper. And then they pass, they go, okay, you need to float it on the, on, with your boyfriend. But we're going to continue, you know, down the line. And I remember these questions being asked when, um, my stepfather was actually um, physically and sexually abusing me, and that was a similar instance. Um, and I brought that up, and the question back was, well, did you enjoy it? And I was so stunned. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, did, did you really just ask me that question? Like, it's, this, this is not normal, the way you're thinking. No, that's one of the worst things you could say. Uh, it, 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 to ask a, a, a victim of sexual abuse if they enjoyed it, they, they did that in Scientology to you? Yes. That's a, that is just reprehensible. It is um, depraved. It's, it's, I don't, there is this um, uh, a policy that L. Ron Humber wrote that um, if you do anything sexual that's not within the standard of what his standard is, um, which is, you know, being a lesbian, gay, masturbation, whatever. Basically, he wrote that if you don't have sex to procreate, but to enjoy or anything else, or, you know, you come up with something kinky or whatever, then you're aberrated. And there's something wrong with you. And you're like almost like a degraded person. Like you're disgusting. So that kind of way of looking is constantly pushed on everybody. That unless you're having a sexual encounter to procreate for children, you shouldn't be enjoying anything else. Because then you're like degrading and you're disgusting. Yeah, that is that that idea of... Uh sexual enjoyment uh it, it's not found anywhere in scientology the normal mm -hmm. human eroticism it, it's not found anywhere in dianetics hubbard wrote quote the sexual pervert and by this term dianetics to be brief includes any and all forms of deviation in the second dynamic such as homosexuality lesbianism sexual sadism sexual sadism etc and all down the catalog of Ellis and Kraft Ebbing is actually quite ill physically. Yeah. Un unquote. And what's fascinating to me there is Hubbard hated psychiatry and yet to, to fortify his judgment and his condemnation of, you know, gays, lesbians, mm -hmm. the, the whole LBGTQ continuum, he has to cite psychiatrists. Yes. And, you know, the church has this thing. They say that they're not against gay people, but yet they, Hubbard considered them it's right there in Dianetics to be sexual perverts. One ill. one on a tone scale. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so when, when you make out with your boyfriend, what, where are you at on the tone scale? Would you be on, on Scientology's tone scale? Well, making out was allowed. It was just against the rules to go any further. Now, I if see. you did anything further, then it's against the rules because you have to be married in order to have any kind of sexual contact. So that kind of leads to how I end up leaving Sea Work. Oh, yeah. Let's know. How. So it's because of a relationship? Um. Well, what? actually happened was so I came in I came to United States in 99 and I didn't have a Russian citizenship passport now by then I already had a green card so I was completely legal in the United States but I needed to go back and get my Russian citizenship passport because I was only a child 
and I never, I never received it. And um, it became a legal problem. Um, so that was the first time I ever left Clearwater or SeaWork. And that was in September 2006. And I had to go back to Siberia and get my Russian citizenship passport. Um, obviously, I didn't have that great of a relationship with a lot of my relatives back in Russia because I didn't see them. And we all have that drunken, drunk uncle that is crazy, has served in yeah. prison. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and one of his drunken spurts, outspurts, he... Um, oh, sorry. Um, he actually almost threw me off of an eight-floor balcony. Oh, Jesus. Um, which I was very emotional. Now, I was 18 at that well, moment. Well, no, I mean, I, even even uh, even at my age, at 60, if someone tried to kill me by throwing off an, throwing me off an eight-story balcony, uh, it would be very emotional. Yes. Yeah, I mean, because so, that, that's attempted murder. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, I was very emotional. I was very upset. And um, a few days before, I got in touch with my old classmates from Russia that I haven't seen, obviously, in years. And um, to make the very long story short, I ended up going with a few of my friends to a bar, which just to clear up with the listeners, Russia 18, you're allowed to drink. <laughs> different, Understood. Yeah. Different rules, different. Um, so we went to a bar, and one thing led to another. Um, somebody roofied me, and I got raped. Oh, Jesus, that's, so it's a date rape drug you were given. Yes. And, um, sorry, um, I was so scared, I was so scared, um, and now looking back, how twisted Scientology makes your mind, my first thought wasn't what happened to me how horrible it was, but my first thought was, oh my God, I'm going to get in so much trouble. You mean with the church? With the church. Yeah, that's that's part of why Scientology is a cult. You're a rape victim and you're worried about being in trouble with the church for, for having pulled this in. Yeah, because I obviously did something. Um... And I was so afraid of the consequences because I knew the rules. If you have, like I said previously, have any sexual contact before marriage, you either would get sent to the RPF or most of the time you will get kicked out of the Sea Org. Um, I decided to keep it to myself. And again, I said, you know what? I'm going to shove it down. I'm going to bury this, and I'm just going to put a smile on my face and keep moving. Um, so I came back, came back to flag, came back on post. I got all my legal stuff in order. And about a week later, and during the week, uh, it was so, it was hard for me emotionally to process everything. And it took a week until it hit me that A, I could be pregnant, and B, I might, I, I, I could have easily caught something. Um, sure, you did, yeah. So I kind of battled back and forward within myself. Do I go and tell them what happened um, so that I could get myself checked out? But then if I tell them what happened, Although I know I didn't go and do this willingly and I just went out and got, you know, decided to be wild. Would they um, be lenient enough with me? Um, because it was out of my control. And finally the scare of me catching something or me being pregnant took over. And I just started panicking. And I walked my I walked to the security office in the Fort Harrison in the garage, and I personally knew very well the chief of security at Flag, 
and I asked to speak to him, and he came in the room, and I pretty much told him what happened, and I said, I really need to see a doctor, or at least just give me, bring me some tests, just so that I know I'm okay. Um, right away, I was isolated from the rest of the staff. I wasn't allowed to eat at the same time as they were. I wasn't allowed to see anybody. I was locked up in the security room um, in the Fort Harrison garage for two weeks. Really? Uh, for two weeks? So you're, you're, you're the victim of a felony sexual assault and they lock you up? They lock me up. They interrogate me. They uh, have security checks because they didn't believe me. <laughs> they, I don't know why. They thought I was just making it all up so that I could leave the Sea Org. But that is very sinister. So they think you're looking for an excuse to get out of the Sea Org rather than taking... You, when a woman comes forward with a felony sexual assault, the police take her at her word immediately. There's an investigation. There's counseling. There's medical. Everything. But they do just the opposite to you. Yeah, and not only that, they um, had a male security guard um, do a security check on me, asking me very, very perverted, disgusting questions, um, which was already so uncomfortable discussing any of that with a male in the first place. Well, of course it would be. It, 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 I mean, it violates all protocol. Uh, it violates medical and professional ethics it's i mean it's it's just horrific yeah and i begged them um to take me to the doctor i never received any medical attention whatsoever so after being locked up in the room for two uh weeks being on watch 24 7 i had security watch me all the time i wasn't allowed to see my mother i wasn't allowed to speak to anybody um and after being interrogated for two weeks, and um, at one point, uh, I was doing the sex check, and, and the male security was asking me all these perverted questions, and you know, have you ever been questions about the rape? About that, they went over, you know, how the police do interrogation. They would ask you to repeat the same thing like fifty times, and to see if you change your story or you change any details. So they did that at first, and then they were asking me questions about have I ever been previously sexually assaulted and this and that. And again, my whole stepdad thing came up, how I was sexually assaulted by one of my stepdads. And again, perverted questions, you know, did you enjoy it? Did you do something bad on purpose so that he could punish you that way? And when those questions came up, again, I just, I, uh, you know, you're, you're on the e-meter. So I actually physically put the cans down and I said, I'm done. And I, I don't know if I can use this language on here, but I, I told them to F off. I'm done. I, hey, I would have told them to fuck off. I mean, and you can use that language. I mean, this is, uh, we're adults talking. Yeah. This is like, uh, um. And at that point, I realized that the security guard actually had an earpiece, and I actually heard people feeding him questions into his ear. So this was live. Somebody was watching this whole security check and feeding questions to uh, the security guard. And yes. the um, COC Mo and the RTCMAA uh, Webb, Mr. Webb was his name, I uh, walked in the room, and they yelled at me, and they be basically said, you piece of shit, if you don't pick up the cans and answer the questions, you're fucking gone. You're fucking gone. And we're going to declare your ass an SP, and you're going to be gone, believe me, in a split second. And I was so terrified, because where was I going to go? I'm 18. I have no place to go. I have nobody... In Clearwater, I have nobody in the United States. Um, I actually begged them. I said, I will go to RPF. Just send me to the RPF. And they said, nope. No. You either pick up the cans and you answer all the questions that we're asking you. Or you're a fucking goner. 
That's that was the words. God, what a bunch of bastards. Um, so I refused. I said I'm done. I had enough. Um, and literally about an hour later, the security chief comes back in, um, into the room that I was locked in. And he hands me a piece of paper to sign, which um, at that point I had no idea what I was signing. But they told me that that paper pretty much says that um, I will never sue Church of Scientology. Or I will never say anything bad about them. And if I do, uh, I'm going to be liable to pay uh, $500,000 or something like that. I honestly don't remember the exact amount. And they videotaped me signing that. Yeah, and this is this is where the Church of Scientology is particularly malicious and evil, aided and abetted as it is by its attorneys, who I think are all criminals. You're a rape victim. They've denied you medical care. They've denied you any kind of counseling. They've denied you. They've treated you like a criminal. Yeah. And now they want you to sign a paper that if you ever talk about it or sue them you're liable for to pay them $500,000 bond. This kind of malicious threat, and I'm talking directly to David Miscavige, the leader of the church, this type of malicious threat was created by L. Ron Hubbard in the 1960s. And the church has continued to use this sort of extortion threat, blackmail against Scientologists. And this is one reason the Church of Scientology must collapse and will collapse because of what they did to you and other people like you exactly i mean this is this is this is an, an outrage against justice humanity oh and it gets the, worse jeff i guess okay, so, it gets so, worse. So, so what what happens what happens next after you sign the piece of paper that so that they're safe so that they feel safe um I tell them, well, what's going to happen now? And they said, you're, you're routing out, you're leaving, we're kicking you out. Um, so I was like, okay, so I need to figure it out. Uh, my first thought was, okay, I need to figure out where am I going to go? Um, I need to find a job. And the, one of the things was that since I'm being kicked out of the Sea Org, I was in lower conditions and I was an enemy to the Sea Org. So I couldn't affiliate with any of this Scientologist in the area until I got back into the good standings. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, I don't know any Scientologists. I, I know everybody that I know is all Scientologists, and I can't, I can't talk to them. I can't work for them. Um, so I said, you know what? Let me, let me get a newspaper and find some kind of a job, cleaning, whatever, um, anything I could get my hand, you know, any kind of job. So I'm starting this plan in my head. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do? Um, and they, the security chief walks back in and gives me a piece of paper, which was a printout of a ticket, airplane ticket. And I'm looking at it, and it says that I'm flying out to Moscow, Russia, the next morning at 6 a.m. And I was so shocked. I said, why, wait, 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 why, why did you buy a ticket for me to go to Russia? I, I'm not going back to Russia. I'm legal here. I'm, I'm going to stay in Clearwater. And they said, well, no, you're not allowed to be in Clearwater. I said, fine, I'll, I'll go to Tampa. I'll go to Orlando. Like, but I can't, I, everything is here in Florida. Like, I'm not going back to Russia. I haven't been there since I was a little kid. I, I don't even know their culture really anymore. Yeah. Um. And he told me, well, you didn't cooperate. You didn't do what we asked you to do. So you're going you're gonna to go. But, but again, see, that this is the Church of Scientology. They're acting illegally to deport you. Exactly. They have absolutely no legal authority to do that if you're legally in the United States. Exactly. But again, but again this is the kind of, this is why the Church of Scientology is viewed as a, rightly viewed as a criminal organization. They mm -hmm. think they have police powers to interrogate people, deport them, mm -hmm. and they don't. And their exact word, their exact words was, "Well, you came here from Russia, so we're going to ship your ass back back to where you came." And and that's their solution. You've been raped. They didn't get you medical care. You can't sue them, and they're going to get you the hell out of the country 
and shut you up. Yes, because they realized I was kind of putting my foot down and I wasn't going to play along their stupid games. Well, so no, and I, this, is, this is the church's cowardice. They're going to protect themselves exactly. at all costs. This is how big of cowards they are. Just cowards. So so what did you do? You were oh, supposed to fly I, out the next morning. I threw a big fit. I, I, I screamed and I said, there's no hell, there's no way I'm going back to Russia. I put up a big fight, huge fight. And um, he, I was told that I'm going to be physically escorted to the airport. And they allowed me to see my mother that night. I saw her for the last time. And I said, I asked her to come to the airport with me. And she agreed um, to come to the airport. And the only way they let her come to the airport was with an ethics officer escorting her. And that ethics officer escorted me all the way to the gate to make sure I actually got on the airplane and went to Russia and didn't stay in clear water. And that could be construed as kidnapping, holding you against your will. Of course. Again, again, more criminal acts perpetrated against you. Yeah. So there I was. Um, oh, and and you know, technically the 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 they usually give five hundred dollars if you are kicked out of the Sea Org. So I asked uh, the night before uh, when I realized I, I can't do anything. They they just have all the power over me right now, and I can't I can't do anything. Um, I asked them for the $500, and the response was, well, we spent way too much money on your international ticket, so that's where your $500 went to. Oh, jeez. So even though they have billions of dollars, you know, they're going to put you penniless back into Russia. Yeah, my mother actually gave me, like, $50, and I had, like, $30, and I had $80 in my pocket and two suitcases, and there I was... Moscow, Russia, you know, fighting. <laughs> well, what fighting. happens when, when you land in Moscow? Well, my grandmother was a student member in Moscow, but obviously she couldn't help me in any way because she's living in the sea work, you know, birthing and things like that. Um, so I found in the newspaper um, a couch to share a room with another person. So I was sleeping on the couch, and this lady was sleeping on the bed in the same room. Um, and um, my grandmother paid for one week for that for me, which was like pennies, um, probably like $40. And I was looking for a job, and uh, my grandmother ended up suggesting to me that I should go and work for Applied Scholastics in Russia. And the Applied Scholastics in Russia, what they did is they taught uh, non-Scientologists, regular people, um, English. They had English classes. So, like, wealthy businessmen who want, who are now having international relations and they need to learn English, they would come and get these classes, basically, to learn English. So, I was an English teacher at age 18. Um, but again, the problem with working for something like Applied Scholastic, which is totally affiliated with Scientology, is that I got paid 15%. So let's just do rough numbers. If somebody paid $300 for three hours of one-on-one -on -one lessons, I only got pennies out of that, and it wasn't enough to even continue paying rent for a couch and buying food and metro passes for me. It was just impossible to live on that type of money. I understand that. And and, and that's been a, a constant complaint about wise companies is the uh, all the money goes to the owner. Exactly. And most people are commission mm -hmm. or, you know, pay, paid nothing. It may be straight commission. So that becomes an, an untenable situation. Yeah, and I wasn't what? able to pay rent well for, yeah. my, for the couch. Um, so the lady kicked me out, and I had nowhere to go. Um, a couple times, I just went out, 
And I put my two suitcases in the applied scholastic office and I would just wander the streets at night, go to, you know, bars and just drink water or restaurants, you know, or clubs and just try to keep myself occupied and because I had no place to go. I had nothing to do. And for a couple of weeks, I actually snuck back in into the applied scholastics office and I would just sleep on the floor because I had no... I understand no, that because I'm, you're homeless. I'm completely homeless and... I, I, they couldn't know that I was doing that, and I had a key, but I had to wait until very late at night to sneak in there to sleep for four or five hours and, you know, take a shower in a sink and brush my teeth and change my clothes, pretty much. Yeah, and I wanted to just point out, you join the Sea Org at 11, the end result of that is at 18 years old, Scientology makes you homeless yeah. and broke. Yeah. And they take no responsibility for it whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what Scientology is about. Yeah. Uh, well, how did you work your way out of homelessness? Um, I started to think of how can I get out of this? And I thought, okay, I have no education. I don't have anything. Um, obviously, I can't have a normal life, not even normal life, but even make enough money to rent something, not even an apartment, a room. Um, I need a decent job. Um, and I sit down and I logically thought, what am I good at? Like, what can I do? What am I good at? Because I thought if I can find something that I'm good at, I can BS on my resume. And if I can just prove to an employer that, look, I'm really good at it. And even if later down the road, they find out that I BS on my resume, they will see that I work very well and they're not going to fire me. That was my logic. Um, and I realized that English was my strongest ability, as particularly in Moscow, Russia, where English is needed everywhere and very little amount of people know English so well. So I started applying for jobs as a, uh, a translator. And um, a lot of places I didn't get an interview and or I would bomb an interview. Again, I have, I have no idea how to behave on an interview and how to dress. And I remember I came wearing jeans one time and the lady was like, next time you go to an interview, don't wear jeans. <laughs> um, so to, it, it took a while. And... I realize I'm failing. I'm not. I'm not getting a job. I'm not getting an. Uh, I'm not getting in it. And so I applied for this job that was for um, an executive assistant slash translator for the CEO of the Starbucks Incorporated in Russia. Who hmm. was an American who was transferred, and he was the CEO of Starbucks in Russia. Um, and. I came into the interview and I brought my BS resume, you know, that I finished Clearwater High School and all this stuff. Um, and I was talking to him and answering his questions. And then it just dawned on me and I realized, you know, this BSing is not going to work. And just out of desperation, I just said, you know what, I'm sorry, just scratch everything. Let's start from the beginning. And I'm sorry for lying to you. And I just told him exactly what happened to me. I told him I was in a CERC. I told him what happened. I told him everything. And the man looked at me and he said, the fact that you're honest and the fact that you obviously speak very well English and the fact that you didn't BS me through this and you were being very honest. And of course, a little bit of pittiness. But the main part is that you were honest. I'll hire you. Because you, wow. somebody needs to give you a chance. You have beaten up way too much. Oh, thank God for that, man. Yeah. Willing to just willing to help you. Yeah. So I had a decent job and a decent paycheck. And after almost two years, I saved up money and came back to Clearwater. I paid off my freeloader debt. I will finished my conditions. I was finishing liability. Um, and I was quote unquote making up the damage and I came back to Clearwater and I was told you're not allowed to be in Clearwater because you're not done with your lower condition. So they kicked me out again. 
<sighs> yeah, they well, they think they own Clearwater. So where did you go when you were told you're not allowed in Clearwater? Well, here's the thing. I, I came to Clearwater and, and I had, I was renting on an apartment. Uh, I already put a down payment on an apartment the first and the last month who was a Scientologist who I was rating, renting this apartment from. I had a job lined up as a, a living babysitter um, for OT, Scientology OTs who were going to, you know, on public who were in the AO and somebody needed to take care of their three kids and a dog. And I had all this lined up and I was going to start fresh. And they told me, yeah, I can't be in clear water. And again, I have no place to go. Again, I'm homeless. And I called my mother and I said, what the, well, like, what the fuck? Like, I've, I've tried. I've done everything they wanted. You know, I've tried everything. And yet again, this is just so unjust. So she contacted one of the, the there's a few Russian public in, at Flag. And this guy owned his own 18-wheeler trucking company. And he, she basically arranged for me um, to help him. Uh, with admin needs um, until I was able to find something. So I got in touch with him and I said, listen, I heard that you have an admin position. I have experience and this and that. And he goes, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm going on the road to California. So um, the, the only choice you have is to just come with me for a week until we can, you can figure it out where you could go. So here I was in an 18-wheeler with the strange guy who made attempt to make moves on me uh, for one week going to California and back in an 18 wheeler. Your life is certainly uh, certainly difficult now but but what but when I ask you, Katrina, you're still consider yourself a Scientologist at this point? Yes, because every single time I would go against them, I would bring up things like, what has happened to me was not my fault. It's unfair. Uh, uh, you know, it's unfair for me to make up a damage. I didn't do any damage. I didn't, like, go on purpose and try to hurt the Church of Scientology or the flag or the Sea Org. This happened to me. So it's unfair. Like, take this, you know, you're not in good standings title off of me so I could live somewhat of a decent life because the only people I know are Scientologists and I can't be in contact with them until I get back into the good standings. And every time I would bring up those questions, I guess they felt like I was blaming them for what happened. And they would just threaten me and, and they would tell me literally every single time they would threaten me. They would, uh, I remember security guard Spencer, uh, after I came back to Clearwater, um, he yelled at me and he said, you fucking bitch, you better get the fuck out of the Clearwater. You have 24 hours. Otherwise, I'm fucking declaring you ass. And believe me, you will never see your family again. Katrina, that is so unbelievably cruel and arbitrary on the part of the Church of Scientology to actually order you to get out of town, acting as if they own Clearwater, acting as if they own you and can tell you what to do. It's illegal also. It's incredibly illegal for the church to do that. And what I want to do is break here. And in our third interview, I want to hear the story of what happens after you're told you have to leave Clearwater. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.